Episode 3, The Ring. What an extraordinary thing. You you heard what I said? Yes. Is he still standing near you? Hmm, fairly. Now listen. Go outside, walk up to the car with him, and then suddenly pretend that you've left your handbag in the bedroom and come back to the hotel. I'll see you in the hall. Yes, all right. Oh, and get the number of the car. Yes, do that. Look forward to seeing you. Goodbye. Ready now? Yes, quite ready, Mr. Wyman. Oh, you've left your handbag. Oh, uh, thank you. your husband on the phone? No. It was an old girlfriend of mine. Didn't sound like a girlfriend. <laughs> and it's the sort of girlfriend I'd rather you didn't mention to my husband. Oh. oh, I see. I hope you do see, Mr. Wyman. Where's your car? It's just round the corner. This is rather a dashing car. What is it? It's a new Phoenix. Is it jet propelled? <laughs> It's not as fast as it looks. Jump in. Well, if I'm going to ride in this chariot, I'll need a scarf. Nonsense, you don't need a scarf. Oh, I certainly do. I shan't be a minute, Mr. Wyman. I bet you won't blast you. All right, Steve. Yes. Where is he, in the car? Yes, but I think he suspects something. I left my handbag on the desk and he spotted it. Where is the car? Just around the corner. Come on, then. Yes, you were right, Steve. There he goes. He looked suspicious when I put the phone down. Did you get the car number? Yes, it's 639GXO. 639GXO. Well, thank goodness you're all right anyway. But how on earth did you know he wasn't Wyman? Well, the penny dropped just as you walked out. I suddenly remembered what he said about Mrs. Russell. What do you mean? Well, you remember, he said she thought of writing a book on Justinian I, the Roman emperor who murdered Focus. Well? Well, the real Max Wyman would never have made a mistake like that. Focus was murdered by a character called Heracles. Oh, get you. <laughs> Fancy remembering that. <laughs> yes, but I only just remembered it in time. Come on, let's go back to the hotel. Will you get me a call to London, please? Oh, certainly, sir. Putney, 9301. A personal call to Sir Graham Forbes. Very good, sir. Oh, by the way, that gentleman, Mr. Wyman... Have you ever seen him before? No, madam. Oh, Mr. Temple, uh, here's your evening paper. Oh, thank you. By Timothy. What is it? Well, look at the front page. The Fleet Street boys have certainly gone to town. Is Richard Ferguson alive, mystery of university undergraduate, Paul Temple in Oxford? <sighs> Someone must have talked. It's either one of the Fergusons or Reggie McIntosh. Yes. Come on, let's go up to our room. would have happened if you hadn't spotted that slip of Wyman's or whatever his name was? I wonder. You know, Steve, it's my bet that whoever's behind all this must think that I'm on to something. And try to abduct me in order to divert your attention. Exactly. I suppose all I talk about a cocktail party at Mrs. Russell's was nonsense. Yes, of course. Well, that'll be your call to Sir Graham. Oh, yeah. Hello? Your call to London, sir. Oh. Hold on a moment, please. Hello? Hello, Sir Graham. Temple here. Oh, hello, Temple. Sir Graham, tell me, did you get in touch with Max Wyman? I phoned his dig soon after you left. Unfortunately, Wyman's away. He's not due back in Oxford until tomorrow night. Who did you speak to? What do you mean? Well, who did you speak to when you phoned? I spoke to a young fellow called Rudolph Charles. Ah. He said he was a roommate of Wyman's. Did you leave a message? Yes, I told him to tell Wyman that you were staying at the Star Hotel. Why, is anything wrong? Yes. Someone impersonated Wyman and tried to abduct Steve. What? We got the car number, 639-GXO. I'll get the Oxford people onto that straight away. Sir Graham, what did this fellow Charles sound like? He was a foreigner, rather an attractive accent. We seemed a pleasant sort of fellow over the phone. Temple, you don't think that he impersonated Wyman? No, no, it, it doesn't sound like it. 
All right, thank you, Sir Graham. I'll keep in touch. Goodbye. Goodbye, Temple. Sir Graham telephoned Wyman, but he was away. Sir Graham left a message with a man called Rudolph Charles. Do you think it was Charles who impersonated Wyman? Mm, I doubt it. You know, Paul, this is a very curious case, isn't it? Mm, what do you mean? Well, take Red Harris. He was mixed up in this case. He must have been, otherwise he wouldn't have been murdered. But Red Harris was hardly the sort of man to associate with young Ferguson. Mm, it rather depends what young Ferguson was up to. And then take this man tonight, who impersonated Wyman. He was a very different type from Red Harris. Oh, well, give me the Red Harris type every time. Yes, yes, I know, darling, but what I'm getting at is this. It seems to me that we're up against something a little different this time. We're up against something... Oh, all right. I'll go. Mr. Temple? Yes? Uh, my name is Rudolph Charles. I'm a friend of Max Wyman's. I spoke to Sir Graham Forbes on the ah, telephone. Ah, yes, yes. Come in, Mr. Charles. I'm delighted to meet you. Thank you. I hope I'm not intruding. No, no, not at all. As a matter of fact, I intended to call you later this evening. Uh, may I introduce my wife? This is Rudolph Charles, Steve, the young oh, man Sir Graham mentioned. He's a friend of Max Wyman's, the real Max Wyman. What do you mean, Mr. Temple, uh, the real Max Wyman? Well, a short while ago, a young man called on us and introduced himself as Max Wyman. But Max is in Scotland. He's, he's not due back until tomorrow night. I, I told Sir Graham that over the telephone. Yes, I know you did. Why should anyone want to impersonate Max? Mr. Charles, did you tell anyone that you'd spoken to Sir Graham? No. You didn't mention to any of your friends that I was staying here and that Sir Graham wanted Max Wyman to look me up? No, why should I? Oh, Mr. Temple, it's common knowledge that you're staying here. In Oxford, I mean. Haven't you seen the evening papers? Yes, but it isn't common knowledge that Sir Graham tried to telephone Wyman. Oh, oh I see your point. I, I'm the only person who knew about the telephone call. Exactly. Well, I can assure you I didn't mention it to anyone. It didn't seem very important. Mr. Temple, I, I'll tell you why I called on you this evening. In one of the London papers, there's a report that a man called um, Mackin... Reggie McIntosh. Uh, that's right. It, there's a report that he saw Richard Ferguson in London two days ago. He swears it was Ferguson he saw. Well? Well, is there any truth in it? Supposing I said there was some truth in it. Ah, then that, that would explain a great deal. What do you mean? The morning after Richard Ferguson was murdered, or, or shall we say the morning after the body was discovered, a friend of mine thought she saw Richard go into the encounter. She actually followed him into the restaurant. When she got inside, however, the place was empty. Well, naturally, Elliot laughed at her. He thought it was a hallucination. Elliot? Yes, Mark Elliot. He, he owns the encounter. Was Mr. Elliot a friend of Richard's? Yeah, in, in a casual way. I see. Mr. Temple, do you think my friend really did see Richard? How well did you know Richard Ferguson? Oh, not very well. We, we met at debating societies, that sort of thing. He, he was not a personal friend of mine. Was he a personal friend of this girl's? No, I don't think she'd met him more than two or three times. Oh, then she was probably mistaken. It was most likely someone else she saw. We're just going down to have a drink. Will you join us? Oh, I should like to, but I, I have a date at half past seven. Uh, some other time, perhaps? Yes, of course. Goodbye, Mrs. Temple. Good night, Mr. Charles. I'll get Max to give you a ring the moment he returns from Scotland. Thank you. Oh, by the way, did you ever meet a friend of young Ferguson's called Jonathan? Jonathan? Yes. No, I'm afraid not. Why? Oh, I wondered, that's all. Good night, Mr. Charles. Good night. Well, I don't care for that young man. You don't? Why not? He's far too attractive. <laughs> And that accent. I will get Max to ring you the moment he returns <laughs> from Scotland. Oh, come on. Let's go down and have a drink. <laughs> oh, Paul, why do you think Reggie McIntosh gave that story to the press? About seeing Richard, I mean. Sir Graham told him to keep it quiet. He made quite a point of it. Yes, he did, didn't he, Steve? Come on, darling. Drinks. I'll see you in the lounge, Steve. I'm going to get some cigarettes. Oh, all right, dear. Have you any cigarettes? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I haven't got any here at the moment. Oh, it's all right. I'll get some at the bar. Oh, very good, sir. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Russell. Good evening, George. How are you these days? Oh, I'm very well, thank you. Can't grumble at all. Well, it's a long time since we saw you, madam. Yes. George, tell me, have you got a Mr. Temple staying in the hotel? Well, you... You mean Mr. Paul Temple? Yes. <laughs> Why, this is Mr. Temple, madam. Oh, oh I, I beg your pardon. Mrs. Russell? Yes. 
What can I do for you? Well, I don't know whether you've heard of me or not, Mr. Temple, but I was a friend of Richard Ferguson's. Yes, of course I've heard of you, Mrs. Russell. As a matter of fact, my wife's just finished reading a book of yours, The Purple Moon. Oh, that. <laughs> Curiously enough, Mr. Temple, I've just finished a book of yours, The Dorking Murder. Oh, that. <laughs> <laughs> the papers say you're investigating the Ferguson case. Is that true? I'm certainly very interested in the case. Well, perhaps you don't know, but I'm considered a suspect in the Ferguson case. Really? Oh, yes. I'm the notorious Mrs. Russell, who influenced an impressionable young undergraduate. You sound as if you've been talking to Dinah Nelson. Oh, she isn't the only one who thinks that way. No? Half Oxford is convinced that if I didn't actually murder Richard, I most certainly had something to do with it. Mm. Have you seen tonight's paper, Mrs. Russell? Of course I have. That's why I'm here. I wouldn't have known that you were in Oxford if I hadn't read... Oh, you mean that absurd story. Of course Richard's dead. I hope to identify his body. I think this man Mackintosh must be out of his mind. I'm surprised at the press falling for such nonsense. Supposing I told you that at least two other people had seen Richard? Then I should say that Mr. Mackintosh wasn't the only person who needed his head examined. <laughs> well, let's join my wife, Mrs. Russell. She's in the lounge. But you don't really believe this story, do you? You don't think that Richard Ferguson is alive? Yes, I do. But it's nonsense, absolute nonsense. In any case, I know he's dead. How do you know? I had a letter this afternoon from the man who murdered him. Do sit down, Mrs. Russell. Thank you. Paul, you have the other chair. I'll sit on the bed. Good. I'm sorry dragging you up to our bedroom, but we can at least talk more freely here. Oh, yes, of course. Well, now, Mrs. Russell... About that letter. Before I show you the letter, I want to talk to you about Richard. I want to make quite certain that you understand my side of the story. I'll do my best. Well, I wasn't in love with Richard Ferguson, and I never made love to him either. He had talent, but like most young writers, he needed encouragement. I read pretty well everything Richard wrote. I criticised his work, I lent him books, introduced him to influential people... If that's considered to be exercising an evil influence, then I certainly exercised it over Richard Ferguson. Hmm. Go on, Mrs. Russell. When Richard was murdered, certain people suggested I was responsible. Oh, but surely... Oh, they didn't actually accuse me of committing the murder, but they insinuated that I'd introduced him to the wrong people. Insinuations are of very little importance. It's what the police think that really matters. Yes, but that's just the point. I believe the police think that I really did have something to do with the murder. Show me the letter you received. It's simply a typewritten note, unsigned. It arrived by the first post this morning. Oh, may I see it? Read it out, Paul. Uh, dear Mrs. Russell, I feel quite sure that you, more than anyone else, would like to have the enclosed. It belonged to Richard Ferguson. What makes you think this note was sent by the person who murdered Ferguson? Because this is what he sent me. The signatory? Yes. If the person who wrote that note didn't murder Richard, then how did they get hold of the ring? Is it Ferguson's ring? Yes. You're sure? Quite sure. So you believe that young Ferguson was murdered and the murderer stole the signet ring and then, for some reason which isn't at all clear, sent it to you? Yes. Where was the letter posted, Paul? Um, London, SW7, last night. Did you ever meet a friend of Richard Ferguson's called Jonathan... Jonathan who? I don't know. The reason I ask is because a postcard arrived after the murder. It was signed, Jonathan. So far, the police have been unable to locate the sender. Is it important? Everything's important when you're investigating a murder. Have you looked at this ring very closely? Why? Have you noticed what's on the inside? No. There are some letters and numbers. You can see them quite clearly. Look. A4, D4. Oh, that's funny. I never noticed that before. You've no idea what it means? Not the slightest. I'm afraid I shall have to keep it and the note for the time being. Yes, of course. Mrs. Russell, you said you introduced Richard to quite a lot of influential people. Did you introduce him to a man called Mark Elliott? Yes, I did. He runs a restaurant, doesn't he? He owns a restaurant, The Encounter. If you're staying in Oxford for any length of time, you'd be well advised to try it. Mm. <clears throat> How old is Mr. Elliott? Oh, Middle 40s. Is he married? 
No, he's a bachelor and a teetotaler. Does he live in Oxford? Yes, he has a very beautiful flat above the restaurant. Was he a great friend of Richard Ferguson's? No. I don't think Mark liked Richard very much. You know, Richard was a very peculiar boy. I was very fond of him, but, well, he could be very difficult at times. How do you mean, difficult? Well, sometimes he talked too loudly and too often about things he knew very little about. I understood him. I knew it was all part of a boyish enthusiasm. I'm afraid Mark wasn't quite so tolerant. Mm, I can understand that. Mrs. Russell, don't you sometimes write for a magazine called The New Feature? Yes. I write a weekly article for them under the name of Europa. Why? Someone sent Mr. and Mrs. Ferguson a copy of that magazine. The name Europa was underlined. The person who underlined it also scribbled the words, If you want to know who murdered your son, ask Europa. What a beastly thing to do. Mm, I'm inclined to agree. Have you any idea who did it? No. No, I haven't. It might have been any one of my dear friends. Mr. Temple, tell me quite frankly, do you think I murdered Richard Ferguson? No, I don't. For the simple reason that I don't think he was murdered. But I'd still like to know who sent the Fergusons that magazine. Mrs. Russell was right about this restaurant, Paul. It certainly is attractive. Yes. I think perhaps they could have done with just one chandelier less. Mm, perhaps <laughs> one. Good evening, sir. Oh, good evening. Have you reserved a table, sir? Uh, no, I'm afraid we haven't. I shall have to keep you waiting about a quarter of an hour, sir. I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right. Where is the ladies' cloakroom? On the first floor, madam. Thank you. I'll see you later, darling. Yes, all right, Steve. You seem very busy tonight. We're like this most nights, sir. On Saturdays, it's quite impossible to get a table unless you reserve well in advance. How long have you been open? Just about a year, sir. Well, it's obviously a great success. Yes, it is, sir. Can I get you anything to drink? Uh, no, thanks. I think I'll wait for my wife. Very good, sir. Why, hello, Mr. Temple. Oh, hello, Miss Nelson. Was that Mrs. Temple just going upstairs? Yes. Do you know, I thought it was. I said to Reggie that... Oh, I'm sorry. This is my brother-in-law, Reggie McIntosh. Yes, we've met before, haven't we, Mr. McIntosh? Yes, we have. The last time we met, you promised... I know, I know exactly what you're going to say. Mr. Temple's annoyed with me, Dinah, and for a very good reason, too, I'm afraid. Oh, what do you mean, Reggie? Well, go on, you'd better tell her, Mr. Temple. Sir Graham Forbes of Scotland Yard told your brother-in-law that under no circumstances must he tell the press that he'd seen Richard Ferguson. Well, I did tell them. Yes. I'm sorry, but the fact is I had a few drinks with a pal of mine, one of the Fleet Street boys. He started to talk about the Ferguson case and... Well, I simply had to tell him that I'd seen Richard. But, Mr. Temple, what does it matter what the newspapers say? The fact remains that Richard's alive, and I'm sure there's a perfectly simple explanation to the whole mystery. I hope you're right. But don't forget, if the murdered man wasn't Richard Ferguson, he was certainly somebody, and someone murdered him. You're not suggesting that Richard did? Well, that's the only simple explanation I can think of. What? You mean Richard invited this man to his flat? shot him in the head so that he couldn't be recognised, dressed him up in his own clothes... That's absurd! Why? Someone committed the murder. Yes. Well, I'm quite sure that Richard didn't. How long are you staying in Oxford, Mr McIntosh? Oh, a day or so. I usually pop up to Oxford two or three times a week. I'm in the textile business. I think we ought to be making a move, Reggie. I don't want to be late. Yes, all right, Dinah. Oh, Miss Nelson? Yes? Have you seen this before? Where did you get that ring from? You haven't answered my question. Where did you get that ring from? Is it Richard Ferguson's? Yes. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. Please, let me have it. Now, Dinah, Dinah, my dear. Why do you want the ring, Miss Nelson? Because I haven't got anything of Richard's. I haven't got anything to remember him by. Now you're talking as if Richard was dead. Only a moment ago, you seemed quite convinced that he wasn't. Oh, Mr. Temple, please, please let me have that ring. I'm sorry, Miss Nelson. What are you going to do with it? Hand it over to the police. But, Mr. Temple, don't you realise Now, realize don't be that... stupid. If Mr. Temple considers that the ring is important, it's his duty to hand it over to the police. After all, Dinah, don't forget, Mr. Temple's a private investigator. So far as the police are concerned, he's in the same position as you or I. I'm sorry, Mr. Temple. I didn't mean to be stupid. Now, come along, Dinah. Good evening, Dinah. Good evening, McIntosh. Oh, good evening, sir. You just leaving? Yes, we've had an excellent dinner and I'm just taking Dinah home. You look rather tired, Dinah. Yes, 
I've had rather a busy time just lately. Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, may I introduce Mr. Temple? Uh, Paul Temple, Mark Elliot. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Temple? Oh, this is know. a pleasant surprise. I heard that you were in Oxford. Yes, most people seem to have heard. Good night, Mr. Temple. Good night. Good night, Mark. Good night, Dinah. Uh, if you should want to get in touch with me, Mr. Temple, I'm staying at the Cromwell. I'll be there until Friday. I'll remember that. Good night. Good night. <sighs> Are you alone? Uh, no, I'm waiting for my wife. Well, may I offer you a drink while you're waiting? Oh, well, thank you. Well, let's go into the cocktail bar. Good evening, Mr. Elliot. Uh, good evening, Bobby. What would you like, Temple? Uh, may I have a dry martini? Yes, of course. Dry martini, Bobby, and the usual for me. Uh, yes, sir. I suppose you've seen the story in the papers about Richard Ferguson. Yes. Is it true? Yes, I think it is. In other words, young Ferguson's alive? Yes. Well, I'm delighted to hear it. Why? Was Ferguson a friend of yours? Uh, no, to be candid, I couldn't tolerate the fellow. I prefer my intellectuals to be over 40. <laughs> No, the reason I'm delighted to hear that he's alive is simply because, well, I find this rather difficult to put into words. You can speak quite freely to me. Yes, I'm sure I can. It isn't that, but... Well, look, Temple, the morning I heard that Richard Ferguson was murdered, I was terrified, absolutely terrified. You see, I had a motive for murdering young Ferguson, a very strong motive. What was your motive? Richard Ferguson was blackmailing me. I'm tired. <laughs> did you like that restaurant? Yes, I did, darling. It's a little flamboyant, perhaps, but I liked it. Mm. And what about Mark Elliot? I don't know quite what to make of him. He's a peculiar mixture, isn't he? Mm, he certainly is. Do you know what he told me, Steve, before you joined us? No. He told me that Richard Ferguson had been blackmailing him. What? He told me in confidence that during the past six weeks, young Ferguson had had about £2,000 out of him. <laughs> Did he tell you what young Ferguson was blackmailing him about? No, he didn't. But Richard must have had plenty of money. His father's very well off. No, that doesn't mean to say that Richard was. Steve, what did you think of Mrs Russell? Well, much to my surprise, I took rather a favourable view of her. <laughs> yes. Mavis Russell is a very smart woman. And what do you mean by that? She can adapt herself to the company she's with. Oh, I say, by Timothy, you are tired, aren't you? I'm exhausted. What time is it? Uh, quarter to twelve. Oh, I thought it was much later than that. Oh, who do you think that is? Uh, it might be Sir Graham. Oh, it's rather late for Sir Graham, surely. Hello? There's a call for you, sir. Uh, hold on a moment, please. Right. Who is it? I don't know yet. You're through. Hello? Paul Temple. Yes? This is Richard Ferguson speaking. What? Mr. Temple, please listen. This is urgent. I haven't a lot of time. All right, go on. I understand you've got the signet ring, the one that Mavis Russell gave you. Yes. Well, I want you to take it to Mrs. Gulliver first thing tomorrow morning. Mrs. Gulliver? Yes, she's my landlady. Mrs. Gulliver, 3 Mortimer Close. Have you got the address? Yes, 3 Mortimer Close. Now listen, Temple. If you do what I tell you and take that ring to her... I give you my word of honour that I'll meet you tomorrow night, anywhere, any time, and tell you exactly what this is all about. How will you know whether Mrs Gulliver's got the ring or not? Oh, don't worry, I'll know. All right, I'll do what you say. Good. Now, where do you want me to meet you? Uh, you suggest the place, I'll be there. Well, do you know the encounter, the, the restaurant? Yes, but surely... If Mrs Gulliver gets the ring, I'll see you there tomorrow night at ten o'clock, OK? I can depend on that. You can depend on it, Temple. Good, I'll be there. Right. Who was it? It was young Ferguson. What? Steve, where did I put that ring? You put it in your pocket. At least you said you did. Yes, I put it in my inside pocket, the ticket pocket. I'm sure I did. Absolutely positive I did. Steve, it's gone. Oh, darling, it can't. Now, just think, when did, when did you see it last? When I showed it to Dinah Nelson. It was while you were in the cloakroom. Then I put it back in my inside pocket and deliberately... What is it? I was just thinking. 
Reggie McIntosh stood very close to me while Dinah Nelson was saying goodnight to Elliot. I don't think it was Reggie McIntosh, Paul. Why do you say that? I think Elliot took it. I think he took it just as I walked into the cocktail bar. What makes you think that? Well, don't you remember? You both stood up. You were standing very close together. And Elliot took you by the arm and moved the table slightly so that I could get yes, by. Yes, you're right, Steve. Uh, uh, come in. Oh, Mrs. Ferguson. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Devil. Oh, come in, Mrs. Ferguson. I'm... I am so sorry to disturb you. We, we did call around earlier this evening. We've only been back five or ten minutes. Are you staying here, Mrs. Ferguson? Yes, we're just along the corridor. We arrived about eight o'clock. We came down to see Mrs. Gulliver. That's um, Richard's landlady, Mr. Temple. Yes, I know. Well, she telephoned us this morning. The poor dear seems rather worried. What about exactly? Well, apparently a letter arrived for Richard this morning and Mrs. Gulliver opened it by mistake. What sort of letter? Well, that's just the point. The letter doesn't seem important. It doesn't seem at all important. And yet... Well? It's from that friend of Richard's. The one no one seems to know anything about. Jonathan. That was the third episode of Paul Temple and the Jonathan Mystery by Francis Durbridge. The part of Paul Temple was played by Peter Cook and Steve by Marjorie Westbury. The play was produced for the BBC by Martin C. Webster.